This is Colin Selleck of Binghamton University. This video lecture is on the kinetic equations of motion, general plane motion. This is from chapter 17.5 of the book Dynamics by R.C. Hibbler. Today's objectives, you will be able to analyze the planar kinetics of a rigid body undergoing general plane motion. Now remember, general plane motion means that the rigid body both translates and rotates. Activities include some applications, the equations of motion, frictional rolling problems, and some problem solving. So here you see a soil compactor. As it accelerates forward, the front roller experiences general plane motion. It both translates and rotates. How would you find the loads experienced by the roller shaft or at its bearings? Here we see a lawn roller. It's being pushed forward with the force of 200 newtons when the handle is at 45 degrees. How can we determine its translational acceleration and angular acceleration. Does the total acceleration depend upon the coefficients of static and kinetic friction? During impact, the center of gravity of this crash test dummy will decelerate with the vehicle, but also experience another acceleration due to its rotation about the point A. How can we use this information to determine the forces exerted by the seat belt on a passenger during a crash? All these problems can be solved using the equations of motion for general planar motion. When a rigid body is subjected to external forces in a couple moments, it can undergo both translational motion and rotational motion. And this combination is called general plane motion. So here we see a rigid body in blue, and it's being acted upon by numerous forces and moments. And the weight vector is located at the center of gravity. We establish an inertial coordinate system, x, y. And we can write the scalar equations of motion, r, the summation of forces in the x direction is equal to the mass times acceleration of the mass center in the x direction. Summation of forces in the y direction is equal to the mass times acceleration of the mass center in the y direction. And the third equation is the summation of moments about the mass center is equal to the mass moment of inertia about the mass center times alpha. Now sometimes it may be convenient to sum moments about a point P rather than the mass center. So if we sum moments about the point P, the moment equation as a vector equation becomes the summation of moments about P is equal to the mass moment of inertia about G times the angular acceleration of the body plus R of the mass center with respect to P, that vector, cross with the mass times acceleration of the mass center. And as I noted in an earlier lecture, if you're going to sum moments about a point other than g, I highly recommend that you use this form of the equation. This is the vector form of the equation. This way, you won't have to worry about the signs. And when we sum moments, always counterclockwise is positive. So we always assume alpha is positive counterclockwise and omega is positive clockwise. If you do this, then they, if they come out negative, then that means that they're in the clockwise direction. Now here's an important note about frictional rolling problems. When analyzing the rolling motion of wheels, cylinders, disc, it may not be known if the body rolls without slipping or if it slips and slides as it rolls. For example, consider this disc with mass m and radius r subjected to a known force p. So the equations of motion become the summation of forces in the x direction is equal to the mass times acceleration of the mass center in the x direction. Summation of forces in the x direction is P minus F is equal to the mass times acceleration of the mass center in the x direction. Some forces in the y, that's equal to the mass times acceleration of the mass center in the y. That equation yields N minus Mg is equal to zero. And the final equation, summation of moments about the mass center is equal to the mass moment of inertia about the mass center times alpha. This equation yields F times R is equal to I G alpha. So note that we have four unknowns and only three equations, the unknowns being P and F, alpha, and N, the normal force. So how do we solve this problem? So we need to make an assumption to provide another equation. Then we can solve for the unknowns. This fourth equation can be obtained from the slip or non-slip condition of the disk. Now you may remember that there are two coefficients of friction. There's mu sub s, which is the static coefficient of friction. And that applies when the surfaces are not slipping. And then there's mu sub k, which is generally smaller than mu sub s. And that's called the kinetic coefficient of friction. 
and that applies when the two services are slipping against each other. So in the case of a problem where you don't know if the wheel, disc, or cylinder is slipping or not, first assume no slip. If the wheel's not slipping, then you know that the acceleration of the mass center is r times alpha. And that becomes your fourth equation that you can use. And when you assume no slip, do not assume that the frictional force is equal to the static coefficient of friction times the normal force. Just let the equations sort themselves out and you'll get a value for F. And when you do get that value for F, you need to check it. You need to check to make sure that that F frictional force is less than mu sub S times N. If it is, then the wheel is not slipping and your solution is correct. However, if F is greater than mu sub S times N, that means that the wheel is slipping. And in that case, you move on to step two and you assume that the frictional force is equal to mu sub K this time times the normal force. And that then becomes your fourth equation to solve. So again, when you're solving a problem where you don't know if the wheel, disc, or cylinder is slipping or not, first assume it's not slipping. That means that the acceleration of the mass center is equal to R times alpha. Do not assume that the frictional force is the static coefficient of friction times the normal force. Go ahead and solve the problem. You'll get a value for F and then check it. Make sure that it's less than mu sub S, static coefficient of friction times n. If the frictional force is greater than mu sub s n, so if f is greater than mu sub s times n, you need to move on to step two and assume that the frictional force is equal to mu sub k times n, and then you can go on and solve the problem. I'll do an example later and you can see how this works. So let's establish a procedure for analysis. Problems involving the kinetics of a rigid body undergoing general plane motion can be solved using the following procedure. First, as always, establish an XY inertial coordinate system. Draw a free body diagram. Specify the direction and sense of the acceleration of the mass center and the angular acceleration alpha of the body. If necessary, compute the mass moment of inertia. Apply the three equations of motion. Identify the unknowns. If necessary, you may have a slip, no slip condition, which we just went over. Then you follow the procedure that I told you then. Use kinematic equations if necessary to complete the solution. If a slip, no slip assumption was made, check its validity. Key points to consider, be consistent in using the assumed directions. This is very important. If you're gonna assume a direction for alpha, then it has to be consistent with the assumption of the direction of A sub G. If frictional force is equal to the kinetic coefficient of friction times the normal force is used, the frictional force must oppose the motion. Now as a test for this, you can assume that there's no friction and observe the resulting motion. And this may help you visualize the correct direction of F sub F. So here's an example problem. We have a spool with a mass of 200 kilograms and a radius of gyration of 0.3 meters. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the spool and the ground is 0.1. Find the angular acceleration alpha of the spool and the tension in the cable. Note that we also have an applied moment here of 450 Newton meters. So here we see the free body diagram. We have the normal force, the frictional force, and the tension in the rope, and the weight of the spool. And here is the applied moment of 450 Newton meters. And in this case, we know that the wheel is slipping. If you look at the dynamics of the problem, this applied moment is gonna cause the wheel to turn counterclockwise and thus move towards the right. Therefore, the wheel must be slipping. So first, let's do the equation of motion in the, in the y direction. The summation of forces in the y is equal to the mass times acceleration of the mass center in the y direction. And our coordinate system is like this. So all the motion takes place in the x direction, so the acceleration in the y direction of the mass center is zero. So this is equal to zero. So this means that n sub b minus 1962 is equal to zero or the normal force is equal to 1962 newtons. Now in this problem, the acceleration of the mass center is gonna be equal to the inner radius, which you see here, 0 0.4 meters times alpha. 
Why is that? Well, you can just imagine that the wheel turning at some angular acceleration is going to wrap itself around the rope, and therefore the angular acceleration of the center has to equal the radius of the inner spool times alpha. So let's sum forces in the x direction. That's equal to the mass times the acceleration of the mass center in the x direction, which we just said was 0.4 times alpha. This is it, x, so the mass times 0 0.4 times alpha. So in the x direction, we have t minus 0 0.1 in sub b is equal to the mass, which is 200 kilograms, times 0.4 times alpha. Well, we just solved for n sub b. It got 1962 newtons. So we can make that substitution and come up with an equation t minus 196.2 is equal to 80 times alpha. So there's our second equation. So let's write that down so we don't forget it. t minus 196.2 is equal to 80 alpha. Now I'm going to sum moments about the mass center. And that's going to be equal to the mass moment of inertia about the mass center times alpha. So about the mass center, I had this applied moment of 450 newtons, and it's positive counterclockwise. The moment due to the tension in the cable, that is clockwise, so it's negative. So it's minus 0.4 times t. The moment due to the frictional force, and it's located a distance 0.6 away, and it's clockwise, so that's minus 0.6 times 0 0.1 times mb. And now I need I sub g. I, I was given that the radius of gyration k was equal to 0 0.3 meters. And, and those two are related by this equation. I sub g is equal to the mass times k squared. So I sub g is the mass, which is 20 kilograms times k, which is 0.3 squared times alpha. So this equation becomes 0 0.4 times the tension in the cable plus 332.28 is equal to 1.8 alpha. So there's our third equation. This is our second equation. You can solve those two simultaneously and get alpha is 7.5 radians per second squared. And the tension in the cable is 797 newtons. Here's another problem. We have a 500 kilogram concrete culvert, which has a mean radius of 0.5 meters. Assume the culvert does not slip on the truck bed, but can roll. And you can neglect its thickness. That means we're going to treat the culvert, as you see here, as a thin ring. Find the culvert's angular acceleration when the truck has an acceleration of 3 meters per second squared. So here's the free body diagram. We have the weight of the culvert, the normal force, and the frictional force. First, I'll establish what the mass moment of inertia of the culvert is about its center of gravity. Now, this is a thin ring. You can look that up in the inside back cover of the textbook. But the moment of inertia of a thin ring is equal to the mass times the radius squared. And that radius, of course, is the mean radius, so it's to the center of the ring. So that equals 500 times 0.5 meters squared. So the moment of inertia about the center of the ring, the mass center of the ring, is 125 kilogram meters squared. So let's write that down. I sub g is equal to 125 kilogram meters squared. Now the most convenient point to some moments about is this contact point, point A because all the force vectors pass through there, so the summation of moments is zero. So if I sum moments about the point A, that will equal to the moment of inertia of the mass center times alpha plus R of G with respect to A cross with the mass times acceleration of the mass center. This is the vector form of the summation of moments equation. I highly recommend you use this form if you're going to sum moments about a point other than the mass center. That way the last term becomes easy to figure out. So as we said, there are no moments about the point A, so 0 is equal to Ig, which is 125 kilogram meter squared, times alpha, plus, now R of G with respect to A, I'm on A looking at G, so it's 0.5J.
cross with the mass times acceleration of the mass center, which we know is in the i direction, and we're going to assume it positive. So this equation becomes 0 is equal to 125 times alpha minus 250 times acceleration of the mass center. So let's write that down so we don't forget. 0 is equal to 125 alpha minus 250 acceleration of mass center. So that's the one equation. Now since the culvert does not slip, the point A is the instantaneous center of zero velocity with respect to the truck. Therefore the point A is doing whatever the truck is doing. Therefore the acceleration of the point A is the same as the acceleration of the truck which is 3 meters per second squared. We need to know the acceleration of G so we're going to apply the relative acceleration equation. So the acceleration of the point G is equal to the acceleration of the point A plus alpha cross R of G with respect to A minus omega squared R of G with respect to A. Now we know that the acceleration of G is in the I direction, so this becomes acceleration of G in the I is equal to acceleration of the point A, which we just determined was 3 meters per second squared, and it is also in the I direction, plus alpha, always in the K direction, crossed with R of G with respect to A, and that is 0.5J, minus omega squared times that same vector again, 0.5J. So when you do, do the cross products and collect terms, this becomes 3 minus 0 0.5 alpha in the i minus omega squared times 0 0.5 in the j. So you can collect the i and j terms and use equation 1 and solve. You get alpha equal to 3 radians per second squared and acceleration of g is equal to 1.5 meters per second. So acceleration g came out positive, so it's towards the right. Alpha came out positive, so it's counterclockwise. And finally, omega is equal to zero, which makes sense. This problem occurs just when the truck starts to accelerate from rest. So the initial angular velocity of this culvert is zero. So here's example 17.14 from the book. This is an example uh, when you don't know whether or not the wheel is slipping or not. So the wheel is 50 pounds and has a radius of gyration of 0 0.7 feet. There's a 35 foot-pound moment applied to the wheel. Determine the acceleration of the mass center, g. The coefficient of static and kinetic frictions are 0 0.3 and 0 0.25, respectively. So the first thing we do is we solve for the mass moment of inertia about the point g. It's equal to the mass times k squared. So you can see that here. Here's the mass times k squared. So the moment of inertia about g is 0 0.7609 slug feet squared. So the next step is to draw the free body diagram and establish the coordinate frame, which you see here. Now, since I don't know if the wheel is slipping or not, I'm going to follow my procedure outlined earlier in this lecture. So my first step is to assume that the wheel rolls without slip. So I have some frictional force here. And acceleration of the mass center is going to be equal to r times alpha. But here's the equations of motion, so summation of forces in the x is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the mass center in the x. So F sub A is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the mass center. In the y direction, I get N minus 50 is equal to 0. So now I know the normal force is 50 pounds. And I sum moments about G and set that equal to IG alpha. So we have an applied moment of 35 foot-pounds, and he's assuming positive direction clockwise, minus this 1.25 times the frictional force is equal to the mass times alpha. We have four unknowns and three equations, so we need another equation. So we're making the no-slip assumption first. We're going to assume that the acceleration of the mass center is the radius 1.25 feet times alpha. So you can solve those equations one through four and come up with these numbers right here. Now you need to make the check. Is the frictional force that I calculated in a no-slip condition less than or equal to the static coefficient of friction times Na? However, in this case, 21.3 pounds, which is the frictional force we found, is greater than u sub k times the normal force. So the wheel does slip. So this solution up here is incorrect. 
now you can assume that the wheel is slipping so the frictional force now is the kinetic coefficient of friction times the normal force and you use this equation to solve the problem with the previous with the first three equations and you come up with this answer right here this concludes 17.5 kinetic equations of motion for general plane motion next up is chapter 18 planar kinetics of a rigid body work and energy